still here. They're after us. There's no more room in hell. What? When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. make a film like this, some people are going to think, you know, gee, this guy's doing something interesting over here. And some people are going to, you know, want to strangle you. You know, but people just flipped out. I mean, screaming, yelling, cheering. I couldn't believe how people loved it. I thought, oh my God, it's so sick. A lot of people couldn't watch the film. It was so over the top. And I'm thinking, oh my God. God, what did I get myself into? It's a great film. The humor, the violence. And the pulse keeps pushing you and pushing you. When you say the word zombie to most people, Dawn of the Dead comes to mind. It is the zombie movie. I was always attracted to the horror genre. And uh, when I was old enough to go to movies by myself, uh, they were re-releasing the Universal, you know, the famous monsters. The original Frankenstein, the original Dracula. As a kid, I got to see those films big screen, and they're beautiful, you know, and they're just gorgeous. And then came the sort of early 50s sci-fi things big bugs and uh, Day the Earth Stood Still and the original version of the thing. So those were the films that really influenced me when I was re at that really early sort of formative stage. But in addition to that, The Tales of Hoffman, a film by the Archers, Powell and Pressburger. That's the movie that made me want to make movies, I think. Because the effects were obvious. You could see how he did it. You know, you could say, well, gee, I might be able to do something like that. I always thought, well, that's, you know, it's a nice, it's a pipe dream. It's nothing that can ever happen. Now, he came to Pittsburgh to go to Carnegie Mellon to study painting and design. Then I just got antsy and left school without graduating and went down and would hang out at one of these film labs. Cities like Pittsburgh had film labs because the news was on film. My first job, I guess, was bicycling these newsreels around to the TV stations in town. And I would hang out with these journeyman guys smoking cigarettes and gluing together newsreels. You know, I learned all the basics from, from them. And then uh, some friends of mine and myself uh, got together and started a little company to do commercials on film. The Calgon story. What happens when a Calgon research team and their submarine are reduced to micro size and sent on a dangerous mission deep inside a washing machine? We were pretty successful for a few years and we wound up accumulating lights, cameras, equipment. And um, always we would talk about why don't we try to make a movie? I had a little short story that I had written about zombies, and it was basically a ripoff from Richard Matheson's uh, I Am Legend. So uh, I took the first part of that short story and started to write the screenplay for Night of the Living Dead. Then we decided to just go ahead and shoot. Ten of us kicked in 600 bucks a piece. And we would shoot for, you know, three days, come back, shoot a beer commercial, go back and shoot some of the movie again. It was real guerrilla filmmaking. We lived in that farmhouse. There was no running water. We had to bathe in the little stream out back. I mean, this went on for almost a year. So we were just lucky that, you know, all the actors stuck with us and nobody got hurt or, 
killed or anything, and we were able to finish the film. Welcome to a night of total terror. Night of the living dead. The film wasn't very successful right away. It actually returned money over the first six months or so, but it never was a huge success. And then it came back. It was sort of discovered in France, and then a few uh, critics in the U.S. started to jump on the bandwagon and say, gee, there's more to this film than meets the eye. <laughs> Theater owners would show Night of the Living Dead at midnight. People would, would go, and it became this event. We started to get phone calls from Hollywood saying, you know, can you make another one of those or you want to come and make a horror movie for us? And I was just resisting completely. I didn't want to get typecast. So we managed to scrounge together a few bucks to shoot, there's always vanilla, and a few bucks to shoot the season of The Witch. And then end the crazy. But none of those films got seen by anybody. They weren't getting good distribution. And at that point, I mean, I dropped pretty much off the radar because, uh, you know, having taken these several more shots at the wheel and nothing turned out. Um, and you know how Hollywood is. If you don't, you know, if you don't hear from hear about somebody in the last week, well, they must be they must have died or something. You know, I met Richard Rubenstein, and Richard was able to go and raise the money to shoot Martin. In the meantime, I was out taking a tour of the mall one day. We had friends here in Pittsburgh who owned the Monroeville Mall. It was one of the first indoor malls in the country. And they said, you know, you could survive up there if, in the event of a nuclear attack or something. So I said, well, gee, what about a zombie attack? That gave me the idea. I said, this is a perfect way to do another film, have people trying to escape the living dead, and they, they wind up in this shopping mall, you know, this consumer paradise. Why do they come here? Some kind of instinct, memory, what they used to do. This was an important place in their lives. I actually started to write the screenplay, and simultaneous to that, um, Dario Argento called up from Italy and said that he would be interested if I was interested in doing another zombie film. I was in New York because my mio film was Suspiria. E in that occasion, a friend of mine invited me to meet Giorgio Romero and Rubinstein, his producer, and a friend, a dear friend. And so we met, I was... Lui piacque vedere il mio film, io vidi eh, gli ultimi lavori che aveva fatto, che era Martin, eh, che ancora non era uscito. E, e così lui mi disse, eh, lui e Rubista mi dissero che avevano un progetto di fare il seguito della morte, della notte dei morti viventi. So Dario said, you come, uh, come. I said, I'll write it. He said, no, you come, uh, come, you write here, you write here. Invitammo Giorgio a venire a Roma. E, um, e che forse nell'atmosfera di vera, un'atmosfera diversa, sarebbe, la, la sceneggiatura sarebbe nata meglio. We have flown to Rome to live in an apartment in the most beautiful part of the city and George would have to write for two days and then some translator would pick up the stuff every couple days and translate it and then uh, Dario Argento would come over and <laughs> take us out to dinner and discuss it. It was wonderful. You know, he was a wild artist, flamboyant and wild. And he didn't speak much English then. And the two of them, it was, they would just smile at each other in <laughs> body language, you know, it was so funny. <laughs> Dario and I never talked ideas. I mean, his salute, he was, he was very, sort of very respectful that way. A lui io mi fidavo moltissimo. Io, lui me l'ha scritto in, un, in una dedica. Io penso che... In un momento in cui era, ha fatto un film di cui forse era poco, poco soddisfatto, e così, io invece gli portai un entusiasmo genuino, un, un, un amore, un affetto, una, una certezza nei suoi mezzi. He said, you make, film, you make the film you want to make. I finished the script in this little apartment. It took me about three and a half weeks to finish it. My wife, Chris, was saying to me the whole time, you know, you're nuts. George. This is too big. This is too big. Do you think you're MGM or something? I mean, this is huge. We can never make this, you know. 
But he said, oh, yeah, we can, we can, don't worry. George, I have learned, always writes his vision and then says, I'll figure a way. And then he always does what he wants, and somehow he pulls it off. <laughs> I, don't... I think that we felt that we could do it for under a million. Richard Rubenstein, he always used to say, I'll tell you what the parameters of the box are. But once you're in there, you can do whatever you want. He was great that way. We didn't know of a proper way of make filmmaking at that point. So, okay, okay, let's call up and see who can, you know, who can do what. Who are you going to call? You call your friends, you know. I got a telegram from George, and it said, uh, hey, we've got another gig. Start thinking of ways to kill people. Wow, what's this? So, of course, I called him immediately. And then I think, um, I think I got the script. The script for Dawn of the Dead, I followed his, his instructions to the letter. Start thinking of ways to kill people. We had a casting session in New York where my wife, Chris, and, and a lot of other friends of ours who were actors used to work. I was working in a restaurant called Lady Astor's where um, uh, David Engie also worked. I was cooking uh, in this restaurant, and I would get to work around 4, 4.30 every afternoon. George came in with Chris, his wife. And he mentioned that he was in New York uh, casting for a movie he was about to do. She uh, asked me if I wanted to audition for Dawn of the Dead. And I said, well, certainly. I could run. I went through it once, and then I went to a callback. I could run right tonight. Then he just put his hand on my shoulder. He said, OK, you got it. <laughs> it was that simple. And I said, can I audition? And he said, sure, why not? And uh, I did. Hello, HQ. This is police doc. Operator dead. Post abandoned. After the audition, uh, he, I was told that I had the role, so, which was exciting. Wake up, sucker. We're thieves and we're bad guys. That's exactly what we are. Dwayne Jones, who starred in Night of the Living Dead, was a friend of mine. I said, Dwayne, I want to do Dawn of the Dead, the, the, the sequel, the next one. He said, he said, really? He said, yeah, say hello to George for me. I said, OK. Sorry you found out I'm pregnant, because I don't want to be treated any differently than you treat each other. I went into this audition, and I got the part which was the good news. The bad news was I didn't know how to act. <laughs> I never worked professionally before in my life. Everybody said, oh, this is really <laughs> great, but I was terrified. We drew heavily upon the people we had always worked with, of course. Once the news came out that George has another film, um, the walk-ins came and our friends came, and we knew pretty much who we were going to be using. I'd say maybe 15 people at the most. And we just put, them, put everybody together and started to talk about how we're going to pull this off. It's the our gang style of shooting. You know, let's make a film. You know, th that's the way it was, it was done, pretty much. It was the very first day of shooting. It was the first feature I had ever done, and I'm nervous. As production manager, I was just responsible for getting everything together to be where it needed to be at the time it needed to be there. I was very young, too dumb to realize how much was on my shoulders. And George turns to me and he says, we are gonna make a movie. returning to life and attacking the living. I'm not so sure what to believe, Doctor. All we get is what you people tell us. And it's hard enough to believe it's without... It's fact, it's fact. It's hard enough to believe without you coming in here and... You're not running a talk show here, Mr. Berman. You can forget pitching an audience the moral bullshit they want to hear. In the first five minutes, it was a powerful scene. George told me and David that he, he needed our scene to be really energetic and all this kind of stuff because it's the lead into the rest of the movie. David Early and I, who uh, was my scene partner, he was the interviewer, uh, had been in some plays together, so we were used to working together. And I said, look, we got this part, to, this role together. Why don't we get together and run some lines so when we get there, we're ready. It was at uh, WPGH Studios, Channel 53 in the North Hills. I said, well, George, we rehearsed a little bit. And he says, really? People aren't willing to accept your solutions, doctor. And I, for one, don't blame them. Every dead body.
body that is not exterminated becomes one of them. It gets up and kills. The people it kills get up and kill. I think he bought the first take. Then later, he gave me this hug, and George is big. I mean, he can pick me up off the floor, but it's like giving me that big bear hug. I mean, that's George. I was thinking, yeah, that's this, this film acting is really easy. There's a scene in the project. It was such a, an exciting event. There were so many things happening. I mean, guns, shooting, explosions, squibs, dead people coming to life. Everybody was into it, and everyone was excited about it. Dawn of the Dead was a learning experience. My job was special effects. Take the script and create what's in there as realistic as possible. The script says, blow the head off. We'd read the screenplay and, uh, um, how the hell are we going to do this? We had the rubber head. We filled it with condoms filled with blood, apple cores, you know, shrimp dip. You know, anything on the craft service table went in that head. We sealed it with plaster. So when I would turn it over or, or, or open the molds up, I would have this rubber head filled with these goodies. So we did it brown like a Puerto Rican and the Afro wig sort of and the goatee. And they said, hey, everybody come in. Tom's going to blow off the head and we're going to uh, shoot this head off, you know. They're not doing that. And uh, yes, they are. Oh, great. Let's go see this. <laughs> We all go trooping out there. I'm thinking, wow, okay. Now I got an audience, too. And I remember we cleared the area. The camera was behind me, and I just blasted the head off with that shotgun. It blew up real good. It was an eye full and an ear full and a stomach full. And it was impressive. It was really spectacular. And the crew applauded when that head went off. That, for them, was the moment when they thought, wow, this is going to be something special. Nobody has seen stuff like this before. If they're going to do that in the beginning of the movie, what are we in store for? <laughs> then the bite, oh my god, more goodies. I just went, oh, good. There's no holding back. And then we're called downstairs to shoot the scene in the basement, and all the zombies are there, and they're eating each other. And I will never forget, I'll never forget walking in there. And I looked through the wire, and I went, oh my god, this is disgusting. But that actually made me sick. I was taken back by it. You know. And I said, my god, this will never play the United States. The censors just won't let it in. It's too gory. And I looked over at George. I said, George, this is disgusting. He just looked at me. He went, I know. <laughs> and he just grinned. I knew that we were pushing the envelope with the gore a little bit. I didn't want to shy away from that. And I also had this feeling that it's a real sucker punch. We needed that kind of sucker punch just to say that this is real horror, guys. Meet me on the roof at 9 o'clock. Get out. I don't believe we're it. We're going to get out in the chopper. Steven, we can't. We've got... 9 p.m. all right. Stephen, we can't. We've got to... We've got to nothing, Fran. We've got to survive. Somebody's got to survive. Now, you be upstairs at 9 o'clock, and don't let me come looking for you. Go ahead. We'll be off the air by midnight anyway. The emergency networks are taking over. Our responsibility is finished. I love the story, and I think people watch the film, and they think, well, what would I do in that situation? You know? I think what really speaks to people as a relationship between the four characters. Roger always felt that he was able to succeed no matter what the odds, no matter what the obstacles are, and that's what he prided himself on, which was also his tragic flaw. I read the script, and I said, I can't wait to do this. I mean, you're the cowboy. You're the hero. I think it's every kid's dream to put on two holsters, a rifle, the bandolero around the chest, and I couldn't wait. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. I played the guy who was slightly off kilter a little bit. He was just an ordinary guy. He would look silly at times. He'd make wrong choices. He would fail where the 
SWAT team guys would heroically succeed? In the beginning of the film. Fran was the drag, the weak thing, you know, pregnant, getting morning sickness. On the other hand, she sort of came through as, as, as a heroine and not just somebody that they had to take care of. You know, I liked it when Franny got strong. Usually horror films had women running around in underwear at that point, screaming and crying and, and being chased by the monster. And I think why there's such a um, respect for this film is because it, it went to another place. We were at the airport and there was a zombie and George wanted me to scream. I, I, I said, I'm not going to do it. I won't scream. I'm not going to fall down. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. He's like, what do you mean you're not going to? I said, I'm not screaming. I wasn't going to run and scream or cry or, or do any of that. And Galen sort of woke me up to the idea that that's not necessarily the way it should go. It was early feminist pre-Sigourney Weaver, pre-Alien, where the woman was the protagonist that hadn't been explored yet in horror films. So after that, he never asked me to scream. Maybe he thought, I couldn't, so why bother? There were two days at the airport. The Monroeville Airport, literally, was a grass strip, one dinky building, and a couple little wooden hangars. And since I was brought in just for this particular section, I didn't have a lot of the continuity of knowing other people who were involved as well. I was trying to ask the other zombies, how's everybody else doing this thing? Basically, uh, there was little direction other than we have this great scene and you'll get your head taken off by a helicopter. The script says the zombie stands up and the helicopter blades take the top of his head off. So again, it was how the hell are we going to do this? So, uh, well, what do we need to see? I need the guy stands up. Head disappears, blood flows out. Well, that's simple enough. The appliance that Tom had put together added about two inches or so to the top of my head, and he was able to build out around with a, um, a foam type of component. Then I, w I, I sliced it in many sections and attached each section with varying lengths of black fish line. Laying in on the top of my head were two tubes, which ran then down my back and all the way down back through the bottom of the pants legs. And two guys behind the boxes with the hand pumps filled with the blood. And those were in place through the walking sequence and so forth. When I got onto the crates, the helicopter wasn't running at the time. The blades were animated in later, you know. I just handed that fish line to a guy and said, run. And when he ran with the fish line, Jim's head unraveled. And then we just pump blood in through tubing up Jim's legs to the headpiece, spraying out of the head. That was it. That was the take. When I shot the kids at the airport, Tom Savini's nieces and nephews, I think, I, I didn't enjoy that. No, didn't enjoy that, shooting the kids. Thought that was a little crazy. everywhere. We're still pretty close to John's time. Those rednecks are probably enjoying the whole thing. I knew that that armory was there and the National Guard was there. And it was my job to go and try and get it. And I just went and knocked on the door and spoke to, you know, Lieutenant Colonel, whoever. Everyone in Pittsburgh, including all the National Guard and the people at the Army, they knew who George was, and uh, they let it happen. I guess probably the National Guard that were due to work that weekend um, came out with uh, their tanks and their guns and all their stuff. It's funny how Pittsburghers, you know, they, they just got behind everything. And uh, it became this, this sort of, you know, fun thing to do. It was an event. People really viewed it as kind of a picnic. Everybody was very enthusiastic. I like to see the center of the tree.
It was great. George was so happy, you know, right? What the hell is it? Looks like a shopping center, one of those big indoor malls. Once we started in the mall, it became a whole other kind of filming. We were up at, you know, breakfast was, was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Then we'd all gather down in the lobby of the Bigelow Hotel, and we'd all get in the car and drive out to the mall. We were supposed to arrive at the mall about 7 o'clock, and it'd be full of people. A mishmash of things going on. I would make up the applying zombies or... Um, Think about what, if, what effects were going to happen that night. We'd all be planning or trying to rally meetings with people about, okay, what we're going to do tonight. We needed everybody to put in 120%. I typically would arrive very early along with Tom Dubinsky and start loading magazines and looking at gear, cleaning lenses. And they'd start rolling camera, I think, like 10 o'clock. Then you'd work all night. And continue shooting until morning. It's a little difficult. You know, to just to in the beginning. We were just so immersed in doing the project that it was, you know, I, I don't even, you lost time. We were just doing it. That's all it was. And there was no other life. And I don't remember not working. I've been sleeping. Some of us had to work all day to get ready for the night. The elixir of choice, by the way, it was coffee. Watch your booms, too. We always had styrofoam cups of coffee. We used to jokingly say George never ate. Never used the restroom, only drank coffee. And that's real Jack Daniels, <laughs> which we enjoyed because it was cold as crap in Pittsburgh at that point. Inside, we were like shaking like this. It was so cold, I'll never forget it. It was like freezing cold. It was the dead of winter. We had one night uh, that it snowed. It was getting a little late. When's lunch coming in? It's not coming in. So what do you mean it's not coming in? We're snowed in. They can't get here. <laughs> I said, what? We typically wanted to wrap out by about 8.30 at the latest because the mall reopened. So we shot some incredible hours in terms of working around the business schedule of the mall. And it went, seemed like it went on forever. Working seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And really, for not much money. I mean, <laughs> no one made anything. But everybody was up. No one was ever down in the dumps or depressed. Everyone always maintained a high spirit. We all got along. And it was all a big adventure. I try to make it as much fun as I can for people. You know, we're not doing surgery. You might as well have as much fun as you can. And I love to work collaboratively with people. I mean, if you have 20 people in a room, you want to hear their ideas. He listens to everybody, craft services. I remember George showing the Federal Express man the budget of a motion picture. And he was very free to share the responsibilities of the creation. George would come onto a set, he would say, say man, we're going to be shooting in this direction and we've got a group of zombies coming this way and he'd walk away. I would start designing a shot and then George would come back and say, how's it look, man? George, uh, it was great to work with. Gives you a lot of freedom as an actor. I was supposed to run down the escalator and I just said, George, well, what if I slide down there? And he went, what? I said, you know, I just kind of slide down the center of it. And he said, okay. He was always flexible, you know, to try something else. What I soon realized was that I was being directed in this horror film by this incredibly kind no, yeah, man so, who so would let me do pretty much anything that I wanted to try. And you never wanted to feel like you were letting him down. George was able to get whatever he wanted out of the crew without asking for it. Do you want to do something for someone who treats you so well and respects you and your ideas, you know. It makes you a part of it because you want so much to be a part of it. Who cares if 12, 13, 16 hours have gone by? What can we do next? Okay, and action. The mall itself was like this huge playground. If they wanted to get into a store or something, some guy would show up with a thousand keys and open up J.C. Penney's. We really had no adult supervision. You kids have a good time and uh, turn out the lights. You know. It is an unreal feeling to walk into a mall and to own it, to own it and inhabit it.
You're walking around the mall, in and out of stores. Nothing was closed off. Obviously, there had to be insurance, and we had to be careful, and we weren't allowed to, you know, rob the bank or wipe J.C. Penney's up. And then, don't forget, the atmosphere was Halloween every night. <laughs> we're doing stunts, we're making people up, you know, having a blast in this playground. It was just a dream existence, you know. I couldn't sleep. Life was so boring compared to being on the set of Dawn of the Dead. I got a call from Mozilla Clinton one afternoon saying, we have a continuity error and we need somebody to come out and just do a bit gag. You know, would you do it? I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. Scotty's running from one end of the store to the other. Problem is, coming towards us, he has a sweater on, wrapped around his waist. Going away, in the confusion and the chaos of just getting it done, the sweater was not on. So somehow, he had to lose the sweater so the cut would work. And the cut works because I'm standing there, and then I grab him, wrestle him to the ground, and in the process, I rip it off. Tom had a retractable screwdriver, which he promised me wouldn't go into my brain. And it had a tube. And as it went in, he pumped the little ball and flooded my ear with blood. I still can't hear you. The effect came off great. And it's probably the thing I'm still most known for, no matter what I do in my career. Being a screwdriver zombie is what everybody remembers. Scotty and Ken, those two guys hit it off right away. And seeing the two of them, there's a little guy and this big guy, I just think it's it's pretty hilarious. What do you think, bag it or try for it? You got him? I need lighter for it. You got it. You know, they really are a team. Scott was a little bit of a pain. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, we had a good time. And the sort of humor that we have that sort of naturally developed. We used to drive to the set together in the morning. Kenny tended to be just always like a little bit late, right? And I'm like waiting in the garage and it's freezing cold in the parking garage of the hotel and I'm heating up my car. And Kenny sort of saunters over, you know, he's taking his time and he pops in and he says, okay, let's go. I'm going, Okay, gee, I'm glad you're here. And all of a sudden, we turn on the radio, and they, they have the song, Short People. So, short people, and dun, 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 they don't deserve, dun, dun, dun. I looked at them and said, that's you, that's you, that's the that song that you. What the hell time is it, anyway? Not quite nine. Nothing? As long as we're getting a pattern, that must mean they're sending a signal. We actors, you know, we would eat together, talk together, go over our lines together. It all sort of worked in our personal lives the way it was working in the script. Everybody suddenly went into character. Ken became the strong, silent, I can handle this. Scott became the Joker. David, he wanted to be like them. And I was the drag. I would have made you all coffee and breakfast, but I don't have my pots and pans. The guys would go and do stuff, and they wouldn't include me. I want to know what's okay. No, what's going on? We're going out, and you're not coming with us. That was the dynamic behind the scenes, as well as in front of the camera. 376 takes 6 on 1477. I don't like conflict. I mean, I shy away from conflict in life. And uh, certainly on the set, I really don't like it. Uh, I do tend to write about characters in conflict, sometimes pretty extreme conflict. And, it, you know, it's playing. It's playing cowboys and Indians is what it is. It really goes back to those kid games. Well, I'll be the good guy, you'll be the bad guy. And uh, that's what it's about. I looked at my dailies, and it was appalling. I was sure they were going to fire me any minute. I didn't have a clue what acting on camera was. And I'm trying to figure out, what am I going to do? So I was going to an acting coach whose name is Mira Rostova. And Mira was this fabulous, old-school Russian acting teacher from Moscow Theater School. Little tiny bird-like woman. And what she had was a scene class. And everybody would come on Monday nights. And they'd 
read a scene from a play they were working on. And you know, other people are bringing in Seagull, and other people are bringing in, you know, uh, Hamlet. So I thought, okay, I'm bringing in Dawn of the Dead. She goes, okay, what do you got, Galen? I can't really believe I did this. And I said, well, this is the thing, and I'm in the shopping mall, and I'm being chased by this Hare Krishna zombie. And she goes, what is a zombie? You know, and I said, well, it's a dead person who walks around and tries to eat flesh. It eats human beings. And she's doing this incredibly seriously, as if it was, you know, just another classic that she had to deal with. You must do surprise here. You must do um, terror. Then I started bringing her scenes from, from Dawn of the Dead privately. And she would sit there in her living room and go, oh, okay, now what is the zombie doing today to you, Galen? He comes in, he grabs your leg. What do you do now? Another zombie. And it worked. So I, I had a little help by the time I got back to the shopping mall. Dawn was the most fun of probably any project I've ever done. The role was terrific, and you know, it was a terrific role because it has a, the character has a real arc in the story. Roger! Come on, man! Get your head together! We got a lot of work to do! He really believes that he can, he can beat this. We got this, man. We got this by the ass! No! no! He was wonderful in that, wasn't he? In that scene. It was great, great. Great bit of work there. Jesus, what? My bag, I left my goddamn bag in the other truck. I'd like to see what I tell Scott. All right, Trooper. You better screw your head on. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. Let's go. I mean it, man. Now, you're not just playing with your life, you're playing with mine. When we shot that scene, we really thought we were on top of it. Roger, Roger, watch it! The emotions were going, we felt good about it, we were committed to it. That's it, man. You gotta deal with that leg. Man, I'm dealing with it, man. I'm just dealing with it. Don't you worry about it. Man, there's a lot to get done before you can afford to lose me. That was, that was a, a nice scene. There was a feeling as we were making the film that this was different and it was special. I wanted to try to give it the same thematic core that the original film had and speak about some of my own ideas about society. And I don't think it's an underlying message. I think it's like in your face, right up front. The way society has been conditioned to think that as long as you have this stuff, life is wonderful and being falsely attracted and seduced by things that really shouldn't have value in your life, but do. Everybody would love to hold up in a shopping mall. And whatever you want, it's right there. Jewelry, money, it's a fantasy come true. The whole satire of the consumerism, I just thought that was so interesting how, you know, George was tuned into that. And George had the beat on that in the late 70s when uh, shopping malls weren't as popular as they are today. I was really surprised by the intelligence of the script. It's a reflection of who we are, and it's funny. Dawn of the Dead, in my mind, is much more comedic than it is scary. I don't think it's a scary movie. It's a comic book. It's a romp. With this underlying sense of society going to hell, I wanted to have that mash-like effect of saying, you can laugh, and you can have as much fun as you want with this, but remember, there's something else going on here. Can't we do something? Can't we take him to a med unit? I've seen half a dozen guys get bitten by those things. None of them lasted more than three days. After I am dead and I come back to life, Tom had to make me up. That took about an hour and a half. He layered uh, my face with uh, this moisture and this tissue, very, very thin tissue, and then the, he would just let it dry and he would blow dry and it would just shrink my skin, basically.
did George give me any direction? I don't remember, I don't think so, uh, about being a zombie, because I remember thinking it through in terms of my preparation. So, okay, so what is this about? I'm going to be a zombie. No one really knows, you know, what's going on in the mind of a zombie. I remember thinking that I'm fully a zombie now, but there was like this little piece of awareness still left. One little shred of Roger left, you know, which then fully disappears as I fully sit forward. I was just playing with that as an actor. We never had problem recruiting zombies. Everybody that we asked would say, sure, I'll come out and be a zombie. I mean, seriously, everybody I think I ever knew in my whole life came out to be a zombie. I mean, it was come out to the mall, you know, there'll be some food and coffee wagon and then watch people shoot, watch these crazy guys shoot a movie. It was almost like a tailgate party. Everybody was gracious and having a good time and working all night for a dollar and a donut. And as time went on, recruiting zombies got easier and easier because people started to hear about it. A lot of it was word of mouth and people just wanting to be a zombie in a George movie. And then it's not just that they want to be zombies, they want to be juicy zombies. They want to die in a, in a bloody way or something. You know? which I never could relate to. I couldn't believe that all these people wanted to get themselves shot or bitten. They wouldn't take their makeup off. They wanted to go home and show it to their family and stuff. Leaving the mall, the looks they would get, I can still see some of the people <laughs> with their children, you know, licking and pointing. And there were a few local legends about zombies wearing their makeup home and stopping at the McDonald's or the Eaton Park. So word spread pretty quickly. Tom had to make a decision about what color are these zombies going to be. Night of the Living Dead was a black and white movie, but this is a color film. My solution to the zombies was everybody just should be gray, you know, which was not a good idea. <laughs> sometimes it photographed green, sometimes it photographed blue, so I don't think anybody was ever really just gray. But that was the solution. Mainly it was me just slapping uh, gray pancake makeup on. And on big zombie days, we brought all our friends in to slap this gray makeup on them. I'd be slapping on scars and gaping wounds, you know, or, you know, false teeth or something. Generic stuff that we just threw on people and luckily it fit. And later on, my friend Tasso came in and helped me do makeup. It never could take longer than two or three hours because we need a mass amount of zombies. And at nine o'clock they started shooting, so uh, we were just whipping them out. I was the nurse zombie. I remember how excited I was going to the set, and I couldn't wait to get there, and how everybody was happy, and how you doing? I love doing it. I love being part of it. George kind of lets you, you do your thing. You know, he wanted everybody to be individuals, and I think that if he started telling people what to do, it would be what George wanted to do, and you wouldn't be your individual zombie. It's just much more fun to let people invent their own dead character. And some are very inventive. Some of them really do interesting, quirky things with their, with their bodies. He let us do what we wanted to do and let us take it from there. And you had to stay in character as a zombie. You couldn't change and be a different type of a zombie. When you made your movements, you had to be the same type of zombie all the way through the film. And so you can't, yeah, the concept of how you are and how you have your eyes and how you walk and so forth, you make that up yourself. I just imagined what a zombie would feel like. It was a blast. Everybody was laughing and howling and having a good time, and it was hard to keep a straight face. They were troopers. There were some real trooper zombies on Dawn of the Dead. They were a staunch bunch. You know. My sympathy always went to the zombie extras in this incredible sub-zero temperature. That fat guy in the bathing suit. I mean, he was in the bathing suit in the dead of winter. And then he comes inside and gets shot and falls in the fountain. That guy was so cool, the bathing suit guy. George would get connected to certain zombies. For instance, the nun in, in the shopping mall. The nun's habit is trapped in a door she can't get out. And I'm about to shoot her. And George came over and he goes, 
don't kill her. You gotta let her go. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you can't shoot a nun. <laughs> so we let the nun go, and I just opened the door and let her have it slide out. You know, it's like an animal. It's not inherently an evil thing. He had a very interesting take on, on what was okay and what was not, and very Catholic. We had worked with Mike for years. When you have a long-term relationship with somebody, you don't have to sit and ponderously and talk about style or about intention or anything else. We could talk in shorthand about things. It was like talking to a brother. I was uh, very much in tune with the director and his script. There was a kind of joy, personal joy I had in understanding his vision and his style. And he worked like a fiend on this. I mean, to make the number of setups that he made. Sometimes he was on a dolly, and then there are some handheld scenes. He was just able to take that old BL and sling it on his shoulder and walk around. But it wasn't steady cam; it was Mike's muscle power. We designed a very loose lighting style, so we wouldn't be bogged down with those big moves, which are typically lighting. If you had to, you know, spend two hours lighting every setup, it would have been absolutely impossible. And we stayed very, very portable, shooting quick and dirty, so to speak. Okay, Mike. Okay, just watch as you're going up. I mean, Mike's just this tireless guy, just a terrific, diligent shooter. I mean, his stuff looks wonderful. We shot a lot of coverage. I used to call it the cover your ass style of directing, which is just get a lot of shots and don't move the camera a lot. If you cover a lot of different angles, you can basically cut that together any way you want. You can cut dialogue, put it somewhere else, move things around, change the speed of an action. You leave yourself a million options if you shoot that way. I always enjoy editing my favorite part of the whole process. You can sit there with your coffee or your glass of scotch and think about it for the first time and without having to make quick decisions, you know. The guy is just a phenomenal editor. I would sit and watch, just watch him physically work, and then he, he worked on this little movie scope. He worked on this little two and a half inch square thing. He run the film through there, and he would just cut all of these shots and hang them all over the, all over the room. And then he would go through and just pull them like this and use a scissors to cut in tighter than you could normally do it between frames, and then put tape over it. And it would be a perfectly cut sequence with, with overlap, with action that matched. It's an amazing process to, uh, to watch him. Well, we couldn't have made this movie without Tom Savini. I mean, he's so energetic and he's so inventive. And he's, he's just got a terrific sense and glee whenever he's got an effect ready and brings the stuff out on the set. We all sit there waiting like kids waiting for Christmas to see it happen. And if they don't work, he's got something in his hip pocket to try it again in a simpler way, and he'll never leave you without something. He's invaluable that way. He was a real showman, and he could lift the spirits of a set just by his very presence. Savini was a very talented guy that was crazy and thought he could do anything. We were pumping out three or 400 zombies, and you know, I was doing stunts on the film. I was never officially a stuntman, you know. But I'm the gymnast, you know, high school. And there were some stunts coming up, you know. So I said, you know, I could do that stuff. I used to carry a sleeping bag around with me uh, at the mall. Because, you know, 7 o'clock at night till 7 in the morning, you know. If you're not doing something, it's nice to catch some Zs, you know. Invariably, somebody would wake me up. Tom, it's time to do a stunt. Um, we need some more zombies over here. So that's what made it Halloween, though, because, you know, I'm doing all these things. Hey. Wow. You must get in through the roof. Son of a bitch. Well, what do you think? Can we hit him now or tonight? Tonight. <laughs> We knew there were going to be bikers in the movie. And then the bikers showed up, and you know, and they're real bikers. It's the pagans, you know. Like Hell's Angels type people. They were very nice, all really nice people. They came out and brought their bikes, and you know, just 
for the goof of it. We had the whole gang for a day or two. We also needed people who were able to deliver lines. And Tom Savini said, well, what about us? We're macho actors, stunt guys, you know, on Dawn of the Dead. We gotta, you know, be part of this group. Pasta was Sledge, he, with the sledgehammer. That was his character. He was Sledge and I'm Blades. They were just great. I mean, you know, they were just, again, energetic and they added a lot of flavor and color and actually created these couple of little characters that people remember. Holy shit. They'll get in. They'll move the trucks. There's hundreds of those creatures down there. Come on, man, that's a professional army. Looks like they've been surviving on the road all through this thing. The biker invasion was actually over two nights. We did some uh, uh, preliminary shots of the approach. The biker invasion was very surreal and very, very loud. One of the ways that they got in was blowing out a big glass window, okay? And everybody came down to, to see the effect. Gary Feller was Mr. Special Effects Guy. <laughs> Gary's whole idea was bigger, better. They put too much explosive power behind that bomb. I think the entire glass side of the mall went up in a huge explosion. <laughs> And then we did the big flood entry of all the bikes and bikers. And they were great. The leader was really cute. And I rode on the back of his motorcycle in a shot. And you just see a flash of my back. That was fun. For these guys to ride their bikes through a shopping mall must have been a charge. They did everything we asked, whipping around the mall in their motorcycles. It was kind of hard to tame them down. When they first rode into that shopping mall, the sound was unlike anything I've ever heard. I mean, it was just incredible. Because, you know, you have all this marble and all this, the echo, there's just a noise of just reverbing and coming back into each other. And I have the headsets on, and I thought I was going to go deaf. It vibrated the whole building, and of course it blew off all of the burglar alarms. It was one of those stunning moments, you know, where you say, what have I wrought? Well, it really was our biggest event. Because now we're talking probably literally 500 zombies plus bikers. It was chaotic, and it was probably as close to combat photography as you can imagine, because we didn't have two cameras, and we just ran around shooting the chaos. Communication was almost impossible. George and I lost total communication. I didn't know where George was. He just kept rolling. George came to me and said, I'd love to see a biker go through a storefront window. But yeah, yeah, sure, I'll do it, you know. So they built the plate glass window and they laid it on the floor. And I don't think the floor was even because the glass poured up about that thick, okay? <laughs> It was like going through a brick wall. But the motorcycle broke it, the bike went out from under me, and I hit the ground. I should have been paralyzed. I should have been killed, perhaps. I show this accident to people, oh my god, you, did you, you, you broke your neck. There's a scene where we used a Volkswagen Scirocco to travel through the mall at high speeds. We paid nothing for the Scirocco. I mean, I remember being on my knees at a car dealer begging for the car. We put some sizable dents in that thing. I think actually Tom and maybe Tassos de Marcus did a couple of falls across the hood of the Scirocco. And then we wrecked it. It hit a pillar, what can I say? Mm -hmm. Then he returned it and said, thank you very much. <laughs> At that point, I said, this is so nuts. What don't we have? We don't have a pie fight. Let's have a pie fight with the zombies, you know. We may use it, we may not. But it's good for a laugh. So, okay, it's pie fight. There are pies. The seltzer bottles, and suddenly we're the Three Stooges. And I remember people sliding around on the whipped cream and eating it and laughing. Yeah. 
and I think that it's a giggle. I thought it was horrible. <laughs> I just thought it was over the top, ridiculous. But you know what? Obviously, I was wrong because people love all that stuff. You know, so I'm glad he doesn't listen to me. My boy. My boy. My boy. Where the hell are you? We took it. It's ours. Boy, what the hell are you doing? We're starting to get near the end of the film. I start realizing a lot of the PAs and grips are getting you know, small parts as zombies and bikers. I'm thinking, you know, I'm kind of being left out of the situation. So I lean over to George and say, hey, George, you know, I'd like to do a zombie. 24 hours later, I'm getting this machete in my skull, getting kicked across the floor, and I'm enjoying it, every minute of it. My thing was always to use the real actor as much as possible. We could have chopped a fake head with a machete, but somehow seeing the real actor who can react, it's the real deal, you know? I'm grabbing on his pants and I'm raising myself up and I'm going in for the bite. When Tom Savini comes down with the machete, camera cuts, okay? Then they take the one with the whole cut in it, they place it in my head, camera rolls. He pulls it out. Then they print it in reverse. Say goodbye, Creed. And it worked, it was a wonderful effect. Every time I see it, I go, like that. Give me a fight! Picasso had to die, and there was a slaughterhouse close to my house, so I guess it evolved from that, thinking I could get some pig intestines. You know, we had a rubber chest, and we put that rubber chest on him and put the pig intestines behind it, throw some blood tubing up his legs into that area, and that worked, because they just tore him apart. Those intestines coming out, they are some clean intestines, and that's because Tasso just washed them, rinsed them, you know, and scoured them under hot water, squeezing them and getting all the goo off them because they were going to go against his skin. When they come out, they are pristine. It used to astound me that zombies would argue over who got to eat, something I wouldn't want to come within 10 feet of. People would fight to be the one, I'll eat that, I'll do it, I will, let me. I was appalled. <laughs> I couldn't believe some of the ideas Savini came up with. I couldn't believe that George would want to do that some of <laughs> I think Tom and George like to check things out on me. If I'm really, if Chris is really grossed out, then this is good. <laughs> My stuff has the reputation of being very realistic. My time in Vietnam had a big influence on me. As a combat photographer in Vietnam, and that's what I try to put into the effects and that I do. If I don't get the same feeling that I got when I saw the real stuff, then the fake stuff isn't real enough for me. Special effects are magic tricks. There are certain things you need to make the effect shot work. If there's a weapon involved, I always try to establish the weapon as taking a chunk out of the wall or give the weapon some strength. So when the rubber weapon comes in, it still has that power in your mind. I'm fighting zombies and I get shot. I'm supposed to fly backwards. So when I did it, I'm just diving. And you'll see it in the film. It's me coming straight off the balcony and into a bunch of mattresses and cardboard boxes. Except when I did it, I missed. My feet went slamming into the ground and I, my heels. George runs up and shakes my hand. And that's all I needed, you know. Acknowledgement from George, he liked it, great. Let's move on, what's next? Being the zombie was something I could just like grab onto. I sat there for weeks and weeks watching all of these people coming up with their zombie. And I'm thinking, what? am I going to do? I had to come up with something that was distinctive enough. So I thought, okay, now what happens to this guy? He gets bit in the neck, 
He's bitten the leg, he's shot in the arm. So basically, the zombie image came out of the wounds that he received. First time the elevator opens and I come out, it was showtime. <laughs> I think George liked it a lot. I remember him going, wow, King Zombie, man, that's great. His zombie walk is yet to be equal. I don't know how he did that with his foot. I mean, I really pushed that way over. <laughs> and I love the thing with the gun. He's not even aware that he's got a gun hanging off his finger. Those were all things that David invented. His body language, it's really worthy of Lon Chaney. And I was very much at home playing the zombie. I mean, I just had a hoot playing a zombie. I really do. I read the script for Dawn of the Dead. I think the original script had the uh, very horrible, tragic ending. Go on, get out of here. The zombies are, are coming up, and, and there's really no place to go. Get out of here. Jesus Christ, be here. I don't want to go. There's no reason to fly off anymore in a helicopter. I shoot myself in the head with the Derringer. Just uh, end it all, you know. I just give up. And put my head into the helicopter blade and kill myself. That was, I thought, a particularly strong ending. At the same time, I could understand why they thought that would be too difficult. I'm sure I was always saying, you can't kill everybody, you can't do it. And I say, George, it is too much fun to wipe them all out. He doesn't always listen to me, but he cares what I think, you know. So we never shot Ken shooting himself, we never shot her head disintegrating, and George decided to have an upending. You know, these people have been through so much, let them get away, you know. I think they made a great choice. There had to be some kind of uplifting ending. I love that swell of the strings when they fly away in the end. You know, I mean, how can you live without that, man? I used all these schmaltzy library tracks, and it's, it winds up being so corny in places, but I, I dig that. And the first time Dario saw the film, that's the way he saw it. And uh, so we made an arrangement that, you know, well, I could do the edit for English language countries and, and he could tweak it or cut it for non-English language countries. Quando non ci sarà più posto all'inferno, i morti cammineranno sulla terra. Prima fu realizzata una copia non più lunga, molto più lunga, che poi non è quella che si vede adesso. E, e mi fu mandato praticamente questa copia di lavorazione. Poi dopo, in seguito, è stata riportata a dimensioni più giuste. Quando noi ci portammo qui in Italia il film, eh, diciamo tutto in negativo, eh, girato per fare il montaggio, mh, noi ne abbiamo fatto una versione un po' diversa, soprattutto l'abbiamo accorciato perché era molto lungo il film che ha montato Giorgio. Questa colonna sonora ho collaborato anch'io. Mi siamo ispirati all'atmosfera del film, non è che c'è stato qualcosa di diverso. E siccome c'era già in atto, come voi sapete, eh, la collaborazione con eh, il gruppo dei Goblin, allora ci è, ci è sembrato quasi normale, dato che è una collaborazione, devo dire, felice. Quando abbiamo visto il film la prima volta siamo rimasti molto entusiasti, che è stato il film più divertente, fra virgolette, che noi abbiamo fatto, perché ci ha permesso di esprimerci al meglio. Zombie è stato un lavoro veramente molto completo e ci ha richiesto anche molto tempo per farlo, e sempre con la, la supervisione di Dario che anche lui ci dava dei consigli. 
The film initially had European distribution. It really made a lot of money. But we didn't have a U.S. distributor. And we took it around and showed it to the usual suspects, you know, American International, the people at that point, uh, at that time, uh, who were distributing sort of exploitation films. And people wrote it like a pony, but would always come out of the screening room and say, well, <laughs> that's really rough. Uh, let's see, what can we do to clean this up a little bit? But Richard and I both believed that the film's best chance at success was to let it be as strong as possible. So in the end, Richard said, well, you know what, I'm going to just prove that there's an audience for this film. And he rented a theater to show it. And he took out a little one-inch ad in the New York Times, one screening. And uh, we showed up there that night, and the, 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 the mob was all the way up the street. And we showed the film, and it blew the roof off. People went crazy. I mean, people were screaming and yelling, and... It was incredible. It was the best audience experience, I think, that I'd ever had. Salah Hassanen, who ran United Film Distribution, came to the theater that night, saw that reaction, and in front of the theater, in the midst of that mob, I think, made a deal with Richard. In 1968, George Romero brought us Night of the Living Dead. It became the classic horror film of its time. Now, George Romero brings us the most intensely shocking motion picture experience for all times. Dawn of the Dead. Sala was willing to release this film uh, without a rating. And I, I think that it, while it contributed and made the film as popular as it is, that limited its success because it's considered an X. In those days, it was an X. You can't advertise in primetime television. You can't advertise in some newspapers at all. But they, we knew it was going to be a hit. When the film opened at the Rivoli, we saw this crowd down Times Square. And I'm going, gee, what movie is that for? And it was for us. <laughs> it was a very exciting time. I was thrilled to see it with an audience, but it was at that point I realized what we had done. We had frightened the hell out of people. <laughs> the reward for me was picking somebody in the audience and just watching the evolution of their heart attack. For some people, it was too much, I think, you know. I went to see Dawn of the Dead when it opened at United Artists Theater in New York with my grandmother. I told her not to come. I warned her ahead of time. She said, no, I'm coming, I'm coming. So I sat with her. The guy's head was blown off. She just went, oh, oh, my God. And I said, you want to go now, don't you? She said, yes. So I escorted her out quickly. <laughs> Somebody went running out of the theater and threw up. You know, right the... <laughs> so, you know, the, early on, the legend was born. I know it was too much for Chris Romero, you know. I was like, oh, my God, what will my dad say? You get a varying degree of reactions depending on who's watching it. You know, Some guy's getting his head chopped off with the helicopter. People are like, yeah, you know, show us more. I wasn't really surprised at the reaction. Your hero on one hand and, a, and the devil on the other hand. And I was satisfied that we'd made a film that pays off on several levels. Horror fans dig it. People that want its message or its satire dig it. It's a fun ride. And I knew that if we'd done anything at all, we had made a, a crowd pleaser. Those were golden days because we were so unrestricted. And I think that those films reflect that kind of freedom. You know, somebody was actually paying me to go play with electric trains, you know. Oh, I thought it was great. You know, I was ex so excited to be part of it. And it was just all, it was just, everything was just so fun and exciting. The only bad part about that is we thought all the movies would be like that. Salem wanted to do a sequel right away. And I said, I, I wanted to wait. I had a script called Knight Riders that I wanted to make. And we had developed a relationship with Stephen King. And Steve wrote Creepshow. So our plate was pretty full. Eventually, we made another zombie film. But it had, you know, a smaller distribution, and it didn't do any business. So we may have hurt ourselves a little bit there. But uh, that's the way it went. The fandom behind Dawn of the Dead, it's amazing. I mean, people come from all around the world to visit the shopping mall. We have a special trip from Charlotte, North Carolina, just to get to this mall. Came all the way from Germany, and this is really number one. 
Dawn of the Dead. So I'm coming here today for the Dawn of the Dead Mall, which is a special treat, especially with George being here. It looks different, but the, I keep looking out for zombies. That blows me away. And whenever I go to festivals or conventions, the number of fans and the loyalty that they have to this film is really gratifying. There is an industry out there of fans who just love this film and have followed it. I'm just shocked at how many people are out there worldwide who really love this film. They remember this film as like some sort of seminal thing in their, their lives. People will tell you in complete honesty that it's changed them. This guy came up to me and he started to talk to me about how the movie changed his life. You changed my life and uh, you're responsible for the person that I am today. <laughs> I said, are you kidding? I've seen the movie 40 times. I've seen this movie 125 times. I've seen the film 365 times. So how often do you look at it? Every Friday night, every Friday night, I looked at his wife and I said, that's why you don't have any kids. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this one guy came up to me and he says, you know, I've driven 14 hours to meet you. I've been waiting to meet the nurse zombie for years. You're my favorite zombie. When I die, I want the movie in my casket. He rolled up his sleeves, and I kid you not, he had tattoos, like, all over him. And I, he pulled up his shirt, showed on his chest, of every character from George's movies. You know, it, it blows you away. It's, 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 I mean, I think it's nice for George. I mean, I think it's really nice that he has those fans. Dawn of the Dead did a, did a lot for me. I mean, I got Friday the 13th, the first Friday the 13th, because of Dawn of the Dead. And it began the splatter craze. I worked from movie to movie. I worked for a long time, and Dawn had a lot to do with that. You know? A lot of the jobs that I have with the Michael Manns and the Marty Scorsese so all come out of the fact that they respect George. It's been so easy for so many of us who came to Hollywood from Pittsburgh. We've all done quite well, and that's thanks to George. He really mentored, and, and he may not even have realized he was doing it. It's, that, that feels better. And you think, who is this person who makes these horrible movies? It's this lovely, bright, sweet man that, yeah, you give 110% for because you want to. He's one of the best people I've ever known. As I look back, I'm happy I made the choices that I made, and I'm very comfortable with sort of my body of work, if you want to call it that. So I think I'm still considered by Hollywood mainstream as being a maverick. What's that guy going to do if we give him money? Cut. Freeze. Cut. As long as I can keep doing it, I'm happy as hell. You know, that's really all I've ever wanted to do. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's go again. But there's no doubt in my mind that there's a market for, for a fourth film. And particularly these days, this seems to be sort of the year of the zombie or something. I mean, there are all these zombie films coming out uh, or have been out or that are coming out, including a remake of Dawn, which I didn't have anything to do with. The fourth film, as I have it written, is basically about ignoring the problem. It's sort of like trying to live with terrorism, you know. And it, I think it does sort of reflect sort of what's going on today, you know. It's a little bold and a little more expensive. I might have to shoot a couple of versions. So if it all works out, fine. There are some hardcore, true zombie fans out there who are just waiting for the next Romero zombie movie, you know? And all these other ones are just warming them up, okay. <laughs>